Well, good morning. Uh, we're going to start chapter two of Ephesians, and honestly, I couldn't be more excited uh, to get started. Um, it's a very hard message to put together because there's so much that I wanted to pull out of this, uh, but for your sake, I didn't want to spend three hours here, and so I did the best I could um, to put all of this together this morning. Um, it's exciting. If, if you read Ephesians 2, I hope you read Ephesians 2 this week. We're going to discover the gospel. We're going to uncover the great news of Jesus Christ. And as we start today, don't let your mind put a divide between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Okay? Let it flow. Let chapter 1 and 2 flow together. Um, it's very important for us to understand because Paul is very intentional with his thought process as he's writing this. And this is not a mistake what's coming next. Um, this is, this is, it's just awesome. I'm so glad we're studying Ephesians. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for giving us your word, Lord, that we can um, know you, that we can um, study you. Lord, I pray this morning that you would enlighten the eyes of our heart, our, our, open our minds, Lord, to see you, to know you, to grow in you. Lord, I pray that you would remove me from this pulpit, that your word would just be proclaimed for what it is. Lord, I pray that if there's any distractions in this room, that you would completely eliminate them. Set our minds, set our focus on you alone. Lord, I pray that you would bring an awe in our spirits this morning to understand your grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. And that's the title of this morning's message. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And as I said before, it's important for us to not break apart chapter 1 and chapter 2, not think of chapter 2 as a section of its own. It's one letter, okay? It, it needs to continue. Remember what we just studied, election, predestination, adoption, redemption, the riches of his grace, the knowledge of his wisdom the, to, that we have in Christ, and everything that we've been blessed with in the heavenly places is a part of what we call chapter 2. Okay, it, it flows right into it. And we also need to remember again, where is Paul? Prison. He's locked in prison. He's in house arrest, and he's on his knees in prayer writing this, uh, writing about the blessings that we have in Christ. And from that mentality now, understand verse 1 where it just goes right into, and we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, we, in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God. So take a really clo close look here at what Paul is trying to say, and I pray, I really do pray that this is an absolute blessing to you individually, and I pray that this is a blessing to us as a church body. See it in two different realms here, yourself and our church body. Look at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. And it's important to note that in the King James style of version, you're going to see this phrase um, that's added, uh, and you hath he quickened. How many of you guys have the, the phrase hath he quickened? Okay. 
So that's not in the original Greek text. It's something that was added in there so that, that we can understand what's coming next. Not that it's wrong. It's just it's, it's not in the original text so that we can understand what's coming next. So in the ESV, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. And we get to this first major word right here in, in verse 1, and it says dead. You were dead. Now, remember where we just came from, right? We just came off of this climax, this crescendo that Paul has written and building towards that we, that we have all these blessings found in Christ. And we learned about redemption. We learned about the, the, the life that we have because of the blood of Christ. We studied adoption, that we're natural children of God. We studied the guarantee of our inheritance that's found and it's sealed by the Holy Spirit. And our inheritance is to praise Jesus now and forever, for all of eternity. We understand that we have the power of God living inside of us because we are His child. And, and we understand who Christ is. He's our leader. And He puts all things under His feet. And, and He's the head of the church and he's, He fulfills all things. And now there's this drastic turn of events. We hit this climax, and there's this drastic turn of events. And Paul immediately goes and he says, oh, by the way, you're dead. But don't let this rob you of what he has written before this. I'm telling you, it's vital that you remember what we just studied the last two months. Bring that with you into chapter 2. Because we just came off of last week talking about this dynamite power of God. The power that raised Jesus from the dead. And with one breath, He, he created the universe. And with another breath, He can absolutely destroy the universe. And that's what we came off of. It's a dynamite power that, uh, that, that lives within us, that makes us alive in Christ when we were dead. And that's where He's going with this. So look at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now notice that throughout these three verses right here, uh, the absolute deadness that Paul is trying to get across. Okay, it is spiritual deadness, it is spiritual death, it is absolute death, and it is zero life. Now I'm going to stress that this morning. It's dead. And I also want you to look at the shift between verses 1 and 2 and verse 3. In verse 1 and 2 he uses the subject you, because he's talking to the Gentiles, the Gentiles they were not given the law of God, no history of prophets, uh, no spirit of God in any form. But just in case the Jews start to get prideful here, he moves to verse 3 and he goes from you to saying we. Because he's telling the Jews, saying, hey, we're all the same. You were just as dead as them. We're the same. We're together in Christ. He's analyzing the Gentiles. He says, you're completely dead in your trespasses and sins. You are walking in the course of this world. You were the sons of disobedience. Then he turns to Jesus and says, oh, by the way, we're the exact same as them. There's no difference in our deadness. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. All men without God are spiritually dead. All men fall short of the glory of God. No man is able to meet the demands of God by himself. We all miss the holy mark of God. And let me be clear, when Paul says right here in verse 1, he says dead, he means dead. He means entirely dead. It's an absolute statement. He doesn't mean someone's in danger of being physically dead or there's some second death in hell. Okay? I mean, there's some evangelicals that believe that, that with, when man fell from the garden, he was deprived of having the highest form of life of God. And it was that type of death. No, no, no. Absolute death. Some of the great reformers said that this is a state of real and present death. Paul's not using a figure of speech. 
He's saying that all men without Christ, dead. Spiritually, completely, universally, morally, dead. Verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. So here Paul, he gives evidence to our deadness. And this is great for us to understand here, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And there's a difference between them. There's a reason he uses both words here. Okay, this word trespasses is this word peripatoma. And peripatoma means that our nature was death. Okay, our sin nature. And the word for sins here is hamartia, which is the act of sinning. So Paul, is, he's showing evidence of our deadness because some people believe that we're born with the ability to be perfect. And after that one sin, then that's what separates us from God. But that's not true. We are born sinners. Our nature is sin. The sins that you commit are not the cause of your damnation. They're just the evidence of it. It's like a mirror that shows man that we're eternally lost. And there's nothing that can be revived in the souls because the most vital part of the human being, the spirit, is dead. It can't relate to God. And we know this because Paul said that with the law came the knowledge of sin. He doesn't say with the law came sin. What he said is with the law came the knowledge of sin. It's like the law was used as this giant magnifying glass for us to understand that we cannot meet the demands of God. We can't be holy on our own. There's nothing in our bodies that can be revived. We're completely dead without Christ. Something else we need to understand is that total depravity is not the same as utter depravity. Okay? We might say Hitler was far worse of a man than Billy Graham before he met Christ. Without Christ, they're both the same dead. There's no difference in, in someone that's seven years old and gets saved and someone who's a rapist and gets saved. Without Christ, they're both the same dead. See, the point that Paul is trying to make is that death is death. R.C. Sproul calls this radical corruption. What he's saying is that at the very core of our being, we are completely corrupt and dead. Nothing we can do. Dead. And if you were saved at a young age, count your blessings. That's amazing. But you're no better off than somebody that, that lived a life of, of debauchery for 50 years and they were an alcoholic and maybe they killed somebody. Maybe they raped somebody. You're the same dead. And if that was you, if you've lived 50 years of, of life like that and you've come to know Christ... Count your blessings that you came to know Christ and that you went through all that because you got to see what you would do without God. Both ways you need to count your blessings. We're dead in our trespasses and we're dead in our sins. We're completely lost. So you cannot live a life for God until you first relieve a lot, receive a life from God. Let me say that again. You cannot live a life for God until you first receive a life from God. We are totally dead because of our nature and because of our choices. Go back to verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There's a reason I'm reading all three verses over and over and over, okay? He's giving evidence of our deadness. Look at verse 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world. See, we once followed the course of this world. And the word world here is a picture of darkness. It's not good. It is not a good thing at all. It's an evil picture. We followed the system of the world. We followed the desires of the world. And we need to understand that those who are not in Christ are walking dead among us. They're captivated by the social world. They're enslaved to the culture, to the desires of this world. And that's hostile to Christ. It's not innocence. It's not harmless. Because we make it seem harmless because what do we say? Okay, yeah, but he's a good guy. Right? Oh, no, no, no. He doesn't know Christ, but he's a good guy. No! He's not! He's at odds with God. By definition, he is not good. I mean, you can ask him, what part of your life have you submitted to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And his answer cannot be yes because he is spiritually dead. He cannot submit to the things of God. And if he was given the choice, he would crucify Christ all over again. And that's how we were. Never be tricked by this world. It's a, it's a sign of a dead person if they're enslaved to the culture. They're enslaved to media. They're enslaved to indulging in the sins of today. And that's why it's vital, it is vital for us to stay away from the worldly things. It's vital. The world will preach tolerance, equality, inclusiveness, but it's an absolute trap. Because who's the first person that they crucify? It's Jesus. Every time. Don't let the world fool you. It's full of dead people. See, the Bible says, love not the world, neither anything of the world. Be very careful about this world tolerance. See, there's churches that intentionally do everything they can to make their environment seem as close to the world as possible. And what they say is, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but I can still have the things of the world. But, but, I'm, but I am a Christian. Listen, that's an absolute lie. You cannot have Christ and have the world. You can't do it. And that's a major danger for us. It's an, it's an absolute false teaching for us because you can't do that. You can't have both. And this is very vital for us to understand. That's why we shouldn't partake of worldly things. And we'll say, yeah, but I'm a Christian. I'm just enjoying the world too. Now, I'm not talking about separating yourself like a hermit. Okay, that's not it. What I'm talking about is removing those worldly traps that are in our life that we tolerate. It's okay because I'm a Christian. It's a lie from the world. When Natalie was, we were dating, she was in high school. Her, I'm so proud of her, she didn't partake in this. There was um, a small group class from her church. Very good church. Very good church. Okay. A small group class that would meet. Uh. Tuesday nights. They specifically chose Tuesday nights because there was a show. And they did their small group surrounding a show. And the show happened to be about bachelors and bachelorettes. Okay, so listen. The goal was, let's get as many people as possible to our small group. Okay, that show, if you don't know that show, is full of sex. It promotes 
sex. It promotes sex outside of marriage. Over and over and over and over. And they centered their group, their Bible study group, around watching this show. Don't be trapped by the world. Matter of fact, this last year there was a girl on the show. She claimed to be a Christian. And they interviewed her. And you know what she said? I'm a Christian, but I can have as much sex as I want to because God will forgive me. Okay, that should put a burning fire in your soul. That's a lie. But think about the young girls that are hearing that from this Christian. And small groups that are getting around it and they're encouraging it. And maybe they're not encouraging it, but guess what? They're promoting it. We're going to watch it. Separate yourself from the world. It's a lie. It's a trap. You cannot live like the world. You cannot live a life of tolerance. Separate yourself. But following the course of this world doesn't have to be sex, alcoholism, murder, all these types of things. Following the course of this world could be religious. It could seem Christ-like. Okay, And that's something that, 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 that Satan does with the world. Because man is made to worship. We're made to worship something. Even atheists worship themselves. Okay, Man is made to worship. And it doesn't matter how much good you do in this world. It doesn't matter how much money you give to the poor. It doesn't matter how many times you come to church. Without Christ, you're spiritually dead. You're totally condemned. And you're completely and eternally damned. We all once walked according to the course of this world. When you were dead in your trespass and the sins with which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The second thing that we follow is Satan himself, the prince of the power of the air. The best way to describe this is Satan is just an absolute flat-out liar. See, Satan gives you enough good with the bad to make it seem believable. His purpose is death and destruction. See, when we follow the prince of the power of the air, we are known as the sons of disobedience. There's this lie in the world that says, ah, we're all children of God. The world will say, Yeah, God is my Father. Listen, if you are in here this morning and you are not a believer of Jesus Christ, God is not your Father. Don't fool yourself. You are a son of disobedience. Even Jesus told the Pharisee that his father is the devil. It's a lie from Satan. Because what he tells you is that, no, you can be a good enough person and God will accept you. We live in a very godless age. There's no reverence to God. There's no admittance to His authority, to His absolute authority. So the world lies to us and convinces us that we can fit some of the sinfulness in this world into our Christian life, and everything will be okay. That's what they convince us of doing. And it is an absolute, utter lie. From Satan. The definition of being holy, being sanctified, is setting yourself apart from sin. And you were dead in the trespass and the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So Paul finishes right here talking to the Gentiles, and now he includes the Jews by saying we. He's saying we're all the same. There's no difference. We're all children of wrath 
like the rest of mankind. Notice that phrase, like the rest of mankind. And to me, that would be the absolute dagger in my soul. For Paul to say, you're like everybody else. And it doesn't matter if you've committed one white lie or if you're the worst sinner in the world. You fit in one lump sum group. You hate God. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Look at this word passions. This ties directly to chapter 1, verse 18, if you remember talking about enlightening the eyes of our heart. Because passions are derived from the heart. In other words, our desire, our passion is to hate Christ. Then he says, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And this is important because not only are we talking about physical sins, okay? We're not just talking about physical sins, but we're also talking about what's going on in your mind. Because think about it. Somebody in here could be thinking totally terrible thoughts right now. None of us would know. And it is just as sinful as somebody physically committing act. Think about what Jesus said, right? If you even think unholy thoughts about a woman, you've committed adultery against her. See, we have this ability, this innate ability to compartmentalize things from being physical and being just mental in your head. If you are thinking it, it's just as much of a sin. Don't fool yourself. Those are still the desires of the mind. That's the world. It's a lie. Take your thoughts captive. Okay, so let's review. If I haven't said enough time, man is dead. Is everybody with me? You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now remember where we just were. Paul just talked about the blessings that we've received in Christ. And we go from this mountaintop experience down to the valley of the shadow of death. And some people say, no, man's fine. Man is fine. He's just, if we do enough good, then God will accept us. Or they might say, this is a lie too, man is just sick. Man is just sick, and they just need the gospel to kind of help them be the medicine. What I'm saying this morning, what the Bible is saying this morning, the Word of God teaches that without Christ, we are completely dead in our trespasses and sins. There is no hope in saving yourself. Okay, now I want you to, in your mind, put the thought of what you were before Christ. Take those three verses and remember what you were before Christ. Verse 4, but God, but God, hallelujah. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, seated with him in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 4, but God. It's the greatest transition in the history of the universe. 
Imagine the picture of deadness. These first three verses. We have no hope. We're enslaved to sin. We're walking with the world. We hate Christ. We would yell crucify Him if we had the opportunity. But God. That has to fill your heart with some sort of joy. It has to. If you're a believer this morning, it should overwhelm your soul to know where you were. I mean, this isn't some fairy tale. It's not some secondary life. This is now. Do you understand the significance of this? We were dead. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. I mean, don't you see this transition? We were dead and now we're alive? Was Brother Bill Cox to yell amen or something? Can somebody just raise your hand? I mean, holy cow! We were dead! And now we're alive because of God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us. It doesn't say but man. Does anybody's Bible say but man? We did absolutely nothing to deserve this mercy. He gave us this mercy because He chose to love us. The only reason we're able to love Him, to to put our faith in Him, is because He loved us. Because He chose to give us His mercy. Justification by faith alone, which is given by God's grace alone. Do you guys see this right here? But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. And remember, He doesn't give out of His riches. He gives according to His riches. He doesn't even give according to your trespasses. He gives according to His riches. And His love here, it says it's great love because it's God's love. It's agape love. Which means it's dependent on absolutely nothing but God. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I love this because it's like Paul gets so excited and he just can't wait to get to verse 8. And it pops out of his pen. It's like all of a sudden he realizes it's like, by grace you have been saved. This is it. It's grace. You're alive because of God's grace. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with Him and seated with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice in verse 5 right here Paul uses the word dead. So just in case you forgot the first three verses I told you you were dead. That's what Paul's saying. And yeah, I won't talk about it for a verse, but then I'm going to come back and tell you again. You were dead. Circle the word dead here in verse 5. Draw a line to verse verse 1 where it says dead and connect those two. But then do something amazing. Circle the word alive in verse 5. And connect those together. We were dead. Now we're alive. We were dead. But God made us alive because of His grace. Now go to that amazing phrase right here in verse 5. It says, by grace you have been saved. And if you want to write the word alone above grace, remember the five solas, by grace alone. It's not grace plus works. It's not grace plus the money you give. It's not grace plus being a decent human being. It's not even grace because of a a decision that you were able to make. The only way that we are saved or justified is by grace alone. God chose to love you. If you're a child of God this morning, that should bring you to your knees in humility. 
to know that the type of human being that you were, you were dead, but God chose to love you. He chose to extend His grace. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Look at verse 6 and 7. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. R.C. Sprouls has a tremendous understanding of this. I'm just going to read to you what he wrote. Um, Dylan, I think you have this. These are historical events in the life of Christ. His resurrection from the dead and enthronement at the right hand of God. But Paul also applies them to believers. Paul teaches union between Christ and those who come to trust Him so that what is said of the Redeemer can also be said of the redeemed. What once happened to Jesus will one day happen to believers as well. They will all be resurrected to glory at His return. For the present, there is a new mind, a new identity as God's children, and a new ability to live free from the control of Satan. These realities are all part of what it means that the believer is united to Jesus Christ in His resurrection. He goes on to talk about verse 7, and he says, The ground of our salvation is God's love and mercy. And its goal is the promotion of His grace and kindness. I don't know about you, but in studying this text this week, I was brought to tears multiple times to think about where I was And you have to get your mind there. Because we so often glance over, yeah, I was dead. Yeah, I fell into that category. Yeah, whatever. Oh, guys. You're like the rest of mankind. Hating God. But God. The most wonderful transition that you can ever read. Because it's transitioning from death to life. From darkness to light from damnation to glory so that we can understand that we had absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. God. Do you live a life that's pleasing to God? Are you trapped by the world? Are you trying to take some of the world and put it into your Christian walk? Do you promote the grace of God in your daily life? Next week we're going to continue the thought of grace and uncover the power of His grace. But I want you to focus on who you were before Christ right now. I want you to, in your mind, put yourself back to where you were. And then let's read verse 7. So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He says, His kindness toward us. 
And then he multiplies it and he says, his grace and his kindness towards us. And then he multiplies it again and he says, the riches of his grace and kindness towards us. And then finally he ends and he says, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. We're going to sing one more song. I want to sing Hallelujah, What a Savior again. And as we're singing this, I want you to understand where you were. I want you to put your mind where you were. And then every time we sing Hallelujah, What a Savior, I want you to shout it at the top of your lungs. And remember, but God. Man of sorrows, what a name. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. We cannot even begin to thank you for bringing us to yourself. May we remember what we come from. Please give us an understanding of the magnitude of our salvation. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's your name we pray.